Hello and welcome to the next video in the coastal series. This week for your homework you're going to be looking at coastal flooding and different types of coastal engineering. Now some of the stuff that we're going to go through today is going to be completely new to you. Um, other stuff is just going to be a recap of some of the stuff that you've done at GCSE. But it is worth remembering that this is AS level geography. So if you are still writing in the same levels of detail that you would at GCSE then it's not going to be anywhere near detailed enough for you to be able to get those answers. It's all about about the sophistication of your language and some of the different words that you use. So essentially what we're going to be looking at for this lesson today are the following learning objectives. I need you to be able to explain the impacts of present and predicted sea level changes and a lot of that will link into case studies that you've already done looking at the North Sea flood but also looking at the Thames barrier. We need to explain what some of the different coastal protection schemes might be and we need to do that to evaluate some different management strategies. Now obviously this will be building into a 15 mark question that you're going to be doing in class in a couple of weeks time. So to that end that means that we need to make sure that we can evaluate properly and provide case studies to hit all that all important and crucial level 3 on the mark scheme. And you're going to look at two prominent case studies, one of hard engineering strategy and the other of soft engineering strategy. Okay, so before we start to get to any of the engineering, let's start to think about sea level rise. Now, we've already looked at isostatic and eustatic change, okay? Now, it's worth remembering that sea levels are increasing, and they pretty much have been um, in the last 15,000 years since the last ice age, on average at a rate about one to two millimeters per year, okay? And that's because of those natural processes that we've talked about before in, in terms of isostatic change. Um, but, however, we are now rising in four to five millimeters per year and because of that the future looks uncertain and obviously a lot of that is because we've got this isostatic change which is occurring as a consequence of rapid ice melt due to global warming and the enhanced greenhouse effect okay so remember there are synoptic links now there are obviously lots and lots of adverse or bad effects that we get as a consequence of sea level rising. Now the first one is obviously going to be erosion. Okay, You only need to go along those high energy coastlines that we've talked about and you can see that erosion will become a social, economic and political problem for lots of councils and governments going forward to the future. Okay, Flooding also going to be an issue. Now I've put on there especially in the southeast. Now at the southeast you live here, you know that obviously the land is very flat that there is a lot of coast okay but also it's worth noting that they're still suffering from isostatic recovery so the land in the southeast is still subsiding um, as uh, the um, Scotland sort of springs up as the weight that was placed on it from that ice during the last ice age has melted away okay so we still got isostatic recovery and we still got land subsidence so in other words we're still sinking um, so not only have we got sea level rising we've also got the land that's around the sort of sinking closer to sea levels as well. Now obviously this is going to leave a number of different areas at risk. Okay, Now I've identified a few key areas of risk. You've got London, you've got Hull, uh, which is where my uncle lives, not that you need to know that, uh, and we've also got Middlesbrough. Okay. Now obviously these are urban areas that are close to the coast on flat low lying land. There are going to be obvious economic risks to losing these. London we've looked at in quite a bit of detail when we started to look at the Thames Barrier. You've got high class grade A agricultural land that could possibly be at risk. You've got major roads and infrastructure. On the news recently we saw all of those railway lines that were destroyed as a consequence of coastal flooding, of waves, of erosion. You've got power stations that are on the coast you've also got groundwater um, you've got groundwater that might mix with salt water and this is a bit more complicated so as your sea levels rise it might seep into groundwater okay and obviously if we're using that groundwater for irrigation and pumping land on crops and things like that obviously we're going to be using salt water or saline water which could potentially create lots and lots of problems and issues for us. Okay, Now, a lot of those are economic and social. There are some environmental impacts that we need to take into consideration. Okay, So we've got the effect that we've got on coastal habitats and wetlands and marshes. Obviously, they're going to flood. Okay, Although, some of our coastal protection that we're going to look at a little bit later might be able to give us some clues as to how that might get better. We've got an increase in investment in sea defences that we're going to need. Obviously, if we've got more coastal flooding and more coastal erosion, we need more or we need to do more in order to protect it. 
Houses are at risk of falling in the sea, okay? This will increase insurance premiums and payouts for people. Um, and there are lots of other schemes that are around. So, for example, where we're looking at managed retreat, there are habitat schemes on farmland where farmers are being paid up to £600 per hectare in order to let their farmland go to the natural elements through managed retreat. Now, obviously, if you're paying every farmer that's on the coast £600 per hectare, that might be very good for them, but politically that's going to be particularly um, expensive so if you haven't got through those ideas make sure that you rewind it because I rattled through it very quickly and make sure that you've got a series of different bullet points in your notes so that you've got the information that you need when it comes to revision okay the next thing that I want us to look at then is coastal protection so you can pop a little subtitle in your notes which simply says coastal protection now before we get to the hard and soft engineering types we need to know why we would bother to protect the coast in the first place now broadly speaking there are two main aims of management and coastal protection the first one is to defend ourselves from flooding okay that makes sense doesn't it the second is to protect against erosion okay so these are our two main things that we need to start thinking about now I've put three others down there firstly we might want to stabilize beaches that have been affected by longshore drift so in other words longshore drift is taking that sediment away and we need to make sure that we keep it nice and stable and that there's enough sediment on the beach and finally the stabilization of sand dunes and the protection of salt marshes so you've looked at those two ecosystems you've looked at succession on the dunes and on the marshes and you know why they're important okay obviously we need to try and work to try and stabilize them as much as we possibly can and to protect those different salt marsh areas areas. Now there are two different strategies or three different strategies really that we need to start thinking about. Some of them work with natural processes and other work against natural processes. So obviously those that are working with natural processes are going to be things like your managed retreat and your soft engineering. We'll have more about those later. Those that are working against natural processes, your hard engineering strategies, require a bigger capital investment. And what that basically means is they require lots and lots of money, okay? Where you've weighed up the costs of building, say, a sea wall against the costs of having to lose what is protected behind it, whether that's a building, whether that's a town centre, or whatever it is, okay? What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through the different strategies. You need to make sure that you've got notes on them, but remember, in the exam, you must explain the obvious I need you to explain to the examiner how each of these different engineering types works so firstly hard engineering you'll be familiar with most of these we've got sea walls which are sometimes recurved okay they're recurved so that they can reflect back or refract back the power of the advancing waves okay they need to be solid if there are any gaps hydraulic action will get in and they also need to be properly drained so that water doesn't build up behind the sea wall You've got riprap or rock armour. This is where we've got those big boulders, quite often really resistant Norwegian granite, okay, that are placed at the foot of a cliff in order to absorb the power of the waves. You've got gabions, which are kind of like riprap, but they're boulders that are quite often wrapped in mesh in order to sort of keep them together. You've got revetments, which are kind of like groins, but they're wooden barriers that go parallel to the land okay so they're kind of like wooden sea walls really that trap the sediment and absorb the power of the advancing waves and then you've got our good old-fashioned groin which is going to be trapping that sediment which is moved by longshore drift building up a bigger beach obviously if we've got a bigger beach then that's going to mean that our waves have got further to travel the energy will be dissipated and that will reduce the effects and impacts of erosion Okay, there are some other hard engineering strategies that you've probably not heard of. We've got cliff fixing. Um, this is where we put iron bars in the cliff, and by doing that, it kind of fixes the cliffs up and stops them from collapsing. This is quite often used where we've got rotational slumping and mass movement. And you've also got offshore reefs. So offshore reefs are designed to break the power of the waves early, okay, causing them to ride up uh, and to plunge before they hit the coastline, which will obviously reduce the amount of energy that they have, therefore reduce reducing the amount of erosion that occurs. Now there are some negatives to all of these. They're very expensive to build and very difficult to maintain. I've got a statistic there for you. Okay, a sea wall um, on average costs five thousand pounds per meter. Okay, that's huge. And obviously, if you produce anything that's hard engineering, it will have an effect further down the coast. So, for example, if we put some groins in in one location, that's going to trap the sediment and keep that sediment there. That will mean that the next location further down is not going to have any beach because you're trapped 
trapping all the sediment in one location which might encourage further levels of erosion so you've got to be aware of that okay and also sea levels are rising and sometimes they can't keep pace with the amount of sea level rise that we've got there are of course people out there that think that engineering types are an eyesore okay so you keep looking at them okay they're pretty ugly okay i don't agree with that actually i quite like a sea defense but then i'm a bit biased because i'm a geographer Okay, we need a case study of hard engineering. Now, obviously, we've talked about Walton on the Nays and we've looked at the Crag Walk and all sorts of things like that. But the case study that I want you to look at is the Isle of Wight. Okay, so pause this video now, get out the sheets of paper that I gave you for homework, and make sure that you've got those independent notes which looks at some of the different strategies that they've done on the Isle of Wight in order to solve the problems with flooding and with coastal erosion. Remember, you must focus on specific level three pieces of information. So pause it now have a little look at your sheet and get those independent notes down okay next up then is soft engineering okay now there are a number of different soft engineering strategies that we need to consider the first is beach nourishment okay now beach nourishment is where we get lots and lots of sediment and we put it down on the beach okay in order to increase its size this reduces um, the power of the waves because of friction as it comes onto the beach and obviously it's good for tourists as well so we quite often do this at the beginning and the end of the tourist season we also get regen generation, regeneration so sand dunes lovely lots of tourists want to climb on them okay you also end up with lots of animals that might overgraze on the vegetation that's on there but they are very unstable okay and sometimes they can start to crumble and they can start to wear away okay so what we might do is we might look to different strategies in order to make sure that we can regenerate different dunes okay now you need to make sure that you've got a list of the different strategies that we might use in order to be able to regenerate a dune a dune sorry firstly we might replant different vegetation so I've put marum glasses up there because this will stabilize it with the root systems into the into the sand dune we might also use mesh to kind of keep them together to make sure that they don't crumble and to make sure that they don't disappear you've got afforestation so putting plants in there again the same reason um, I've put conifers in there because conifers are much harder and they do a better job at binding together some of the different um, sand dunes. Selective grazing, so don't let animals graze all over it. Fence off different areas so the tourists can't get there, but also so that different animals can't get there in order to be able to graze. And then you've got broad walks, so we might put wooden planks down for, for tourists and people to walk on so that they're not destroying the sand dune ecosystem. Okay. Finally then, we've got some other strategies. We've got, firstly, managed retreat, okay? Now, this is where we basically abandon the current defence line. So where we've got broken seawalls, we let them break away and we let them flood. Okay, now this can cause salt marshes and natural environments to form that will absorb the power of the waves and reduce the impacts of coastal flooding. Now we've already seen this, we see it all the way down the Essex coast, particularly in the Essex salt marshes uh, at places such as Tolsbury, which are some of the best examples of managed retreat or managed realignment. We can also plan properly, so not do stupid things like building buildings and towns right next to the coast or on any sort of floodplain because this is going to create issues. Then, of course, there is the principle of doing nothing, okay? Now, there are lots of people that believe that it's so expensive to be able to put these different types of engineering in that actually we would be far better off having absolutely no engineering whatsoever, okay, and just compensating people for when they lose buildings and when they lose homes. And there are people that believe that that would be a lot cheaper than building lots of sea walls, groins, and all sorts of other things like that. And probably, actually, maybe better for the environment, but it's just depending on those stakeholders that you need to think about. Okay, now that you've got all of those notes down about the different engineering types, I want us to get our case study. So same as you did with the Isle of Wight case study, I want you to get your notes out now and I want you to see if you can get for me some soft engineering strategies based on the case study of the Sefton Coast which is in northwest England. Then when we come into lesson next week we can use this information in order to be able to effectively answer 15 mark questions. Okay, enjoy.